Over the last few weeks on the channel, we've been diving into some of the most goofy RPGs ever released. And it was while doing another deep dive into the topic looking at all manner of games that I stumbled upon something truly extraordinary. Something that makes any and all entries to ridiculous games look like nothing in comparison. An adventure game and a tale that truly has to be seen to be believed. Is that better? Today we take a journey into the absolutely mind-blowing world of Limbo of the Lost, a 2008 released adventure game that has so many layers to its insanity it's a challenge to know even where to begin. But begin we must in this deep dive into one of gaming's most insane experiences by far. What are you doing up there anyway? Oops. Ow. My name's Mitch Mannix and this my friends is Limbo of the Lost. For those lucky enough to be familiar with this title, you're probably aware that the game after its release was hit with a whole number of plagiarism claims, after the game clearly borrowed an embarrassing amount of assets from some of the most popular games of the time, some of which are so blatantly obvious it's hard to imagine how the developers thought they would pull it off unnoticed. So keep an eye out throughout the video to see how many you can spot on this insane journey, and we'll circle back at the end to go through a whole rundown. Every gift tells a story. The game begins with what I can only assume is the hero of our story, being cast down into the depths of some sort of hellscape slip and slide, only to be greeted by handsome Squidward, attempting to lay down some of the game's initial plot over the incredibly loud soundtrack. Nosferatu Mike Tyson here explaining that the dead do not take kindly to the presence of the living, indicating that we have been cast down to another plane of existence, beginning locked up in a dank dungeon. Only a few moments pass before we are introduced to one of Limbo of the Lost's many bonkers characters, walking on the ceiling because reasons. Ah! So you are awake! <gasps> good, good, good! <sighs> no, no, no! Do not be fearful of me! I am to help, not to hurt! I am friend! Here we meet Arak, who aside from his nightmare fuel Yoda sounding ramblings, informs us that we have been imprisoned here by the four evils. And we learn a little more about our protagonist Briggs, a proud ship's captain who according to Arak is of big importance to these four evils. I know listening to this upside down bloke may be a bit jarring, and if you're having trouble understanding him, let me help you. <coughs> this is bad place, cause the dark ones, they are not mercy filled. Arak informs us that he must leave us after releasing us from our cell and informing Briggs of our presence as the player. An earthly guide? Yes, yes! Look! They're on the other side! Whoa! Yo, don't touch me. Whoa. But also leaving us a parting gift. that you would think would be a disappointment to Briggs here, but he really seems to like it. We are then free to begin exploring the wider reaches of the dungeons, strutting down the hallway to first take a look at some of the other cells as we pass by, to see that most of the dungeon's prisoners are detained here by a creature named Grunger, for scandalous crimes, such as clicking their fingers and waking him up, a sight that apparently amuses our would-be hero, this being a face that Briggs for whatever reason enjoys pulling regardless of how harrowing the nature of what he's experiencing looking all but smugly satisfied with himself, even after random encounters with the world's horrors, such as we experience after climbing a nearby set of stairs. Do the face. Do the face. Good. Exploring further, we happen upon another interesting inhabitant of the dungeon, locked up in a cage hanging from the ceiling, who has clearly been left alone a little bit too long, as instantly barrages our Briggs with a bout of verbal diarrhea. We finally interrupt the man to find out a little bit more about him, and learn that Grunger is in fact the jailer who has imprisoned this poor fellow here due to him stinking out the place, most likely due to his unfortunate case of death, which luckily has not impacted his sense of humour. Either that or the chap delivering the lines just couldn't keep it together. Briggs agrees to attempt on lowering the chap down to allow him to escape, and we set about exploring deeper into the dungeons. For the first time, Briggs, I'm right there with you. 
Rounding a few corners, we happen upon the notorious Grunger himself, fast asleep and with his slumbering foot on a headless yet still living prisoner, who Briggs quietly asks for advice of how to escape the dungeon's depths. After all this time, I'm used to it. Oh, good. So, um, are you going to tell me? Well, if that face doesn't convince him, I'm not sure that anything will. Ed the Head's advice is that we cobble together a meal for his sleeping master, with some extra spice to it to knock him out, with the hopes that we can just snatch the key around his neck once Grunger is out for the count. Well, I think we'll just play along and hopefully we'll wake up from this nightmare soon. Soon, Briggsy boy, just isn't soon enough. So we set off once more and quickly happen upon a terrifying 10 foot tall green crone woman seemingly making a giant soup out of skittles, burning atop a collection of flaming urinal cakes. The crone after Briggs introduces himself, of course it turns out is looking to add him to the broth, but after finding out that Briggs is very much alive as opposed to most wandering around the dungeon, is quickly put off the idea, and instead tasks Briggs with finding some undead ingredients. Nice rope though. Shame you're immortal, Briggsy, me lad. <laughs> oh my god. Well, that's an unfortunate placement of that hand. Delving further, we discover a small library, and after picking up a note and a jar from here, we look out of the window to get a good look at our current hellish location. Briggs's mind races with what this could all mean, but we can't stop now. And heading up some stairs, we encounter a set of ropes that seem to both be holding up something in the room below. And with a bit of fire borrowed from the crone's fireplace, we burn them both, releasing the hold on what lies beneath. Well, I wonder who that was. No, on second thought, I think it must have been the stinky guy. As we leave to check out the mess that we've made, we make a stop by another hallway, which sports a sign warning of the grave danger of what lies beyond, what must be a tidal wave of epic proportions, an aquatic malevolence of such destructive power, it would overshadow Poseidon himself. However, luckily for Briggs, it was just a crappy water feature that I like to think was named Dribbly Chin. Oh, and there was also a giant eyeball leech looking fellow, but luckily Briggs scared him off showing his terrifying judo chop. After filling up the bottle we picked up in the library, we uncover another of Limbo of the Lost's quirky features, that of Briggs here getting a bit antsy once left to his own devices for too long. Uh, any thoughts? Ideas? Well, anything. But nothing some more pats on the head won't fix. Upon making our way back into the room with the ever talkative prisoner, it seems our rope burning antics have done the job of freeing him, with him nowhere to be found. Things, however, don't bode well for the poor guy after we find a severed arm amongst the remains of his cell. But on the upside, we'll make a fine addition to our sleepy stew for old Grunger to go along with the tequila that we've managed to make from the bottle of water by adding the worm that Arak gifted us in the beginning because reasons. Returning to the crone, we quickly whip up the brew and reunite with Eddie the head to carry out the plan, which works like a charm. And Briggs is clearly proud of himself for achieving the task of putting the warden to sleep just after waking him up from being asleep and claims the key to release him from the dungeon, which we waste no time putting to use, and are rewarded with a chapter complete and a sneak peek at the new blood ritual Oreo cookie. Finally out of the insanity of the dungeons, we happen upon a mysterious man who claims to be the keeper of lost souls, who provides us with a note with some tips to remember. <gasps> what the? Yeah, let me give you this. Sorry about that. Don't know what came over me. Oh, it seems like the insanity has only just begun. The man also informs us that we are actually in the keep of lost souls, of all places. But Briggs here has another question on his mind. So tell me, am I dead? Yes, tell me. <laughs> dead? Why no? The keeper is also kind enough to grant us with one of three welcome gifts with only one of which, as far as I can see, of being any use, and that being the chloroform to use to hopefully do some work at blackening out the events of the previous chapter. I also can't help but laugh at the idea of getting a free gift from the gift shop after entering purgatory. Searching around the area, we find a couple of coffins containing some quite sleepy human jerky, along with a number of other items to aid in our adventure. You're weird. I'm sorry, I'm weird? People in glass houses, Briggs. Exploring on, we wander past an ominous warning sign, up to a large open room with a number of feeding bowls placed on the floor. I wonder what could be going on here, Briggs thought, as he took a closer look at one of the bowls, 
just before. Are you asleep? I always wondered what happened to Hansen. Luckily for us, the three are attached to a chain that also seems to be connected to the opening of the gates at the back of the room, which must be part of how we escape this hellhole. So Briggs, using a portion of the human jerky, lures one of the three dogs forward to open the far left gate, crossing a number of precarious looking bridges, all the way down to a building deeper than the caves, where we are treated to yet another absolutely insane introduction. Excuse me, what? Oh, I say, we have a visitor. How lovely. Oh, what the... Oh, sorry. I forgot. Hang on. Do not be afraid. Lol. Is that better? <laughs> I've seen it all now. What? What's wrong? Judging by the face on Briggs, I don't think he wants to know the answer to that. Ah, that's better. This terrifying and confusing old man is Bugsy, who along with fumbling about with insects has seemingly also created a hybrid animal of sorts, called a wood gator, that apparently has an uncontrollable desire for wood, leading to various accidents, with Briggs's response to this being of course as grounded and reflectful as you may have come to expect. Well, the little rascal will not hurt anyone anymore. I have him locked up in a room not far from here. Further investigation is required if we are going to escape the Keep of Souls. And after combining a few items, we manage to lift the gate next to the gift shop, revealing an old sarcophagus, and with it the sound of a familiar voice. Oh, come along now, you can let me in now. No, it's alright. I promise I won't talk any more I won't talk, I won't talk about anything. I promise you can let me out. You can let me out this horrible, horrible box. I don't like it. It's a bit too dark. Our undead acquaintance here hands us a bottle that apparently has been poking him up the arse whilst camping out in the stone coffin, and quickly buggers off into the darkness once more. No, no, bye bye then, sailor boy. Opening up another of the dog's doors, we bump into Arak once again, scuttling about on the ceiling looking for food, and offers us a trade if we can find him some creepy crawlies. Keeping eyes for crunchy crawlies. Pushing on, we meet a man who has misplaced his soul, which happens to be the very soul contained in the bottle that was just recently removed from our motor-mouthed friend's arse, which we gladly reunite with its owner. As it happens, our spectacles enthusiast friend here, named Onegus, is a collector of souls of others, and lets us take a look at his fine collection. Briggs, of course, not missing a beat, swaps out one of the vials with a bottle of glowing liquid he cobbled together while exploring to obtain the soul of a warrior from Onegus' collection for himself. Briggs then takes his leave and circling back to pick up some more human jerky, opens up another of the dog's doors to find the dopest of golden goblets to once more feed his kleptomania. Through the nearby door, he hears the sound of birds and looks to investigate, finding a two-headed bird making all manner of noise, along with its rather pissed off looking owner. Maybe I could help. Oh, oh, I know this one. Gonna die. Oh. Blackhawk here pleads with us to do something about the infuriating bird, and it just so happens that we have an eye patch and an eyeball from the coffin search before, which we quickly put to work. Blackhawk rewards us for our efforts with a bone cage, and is clearly disturbingly relieved at his newfound peace and quiet. Or maybe he's simply basking in the glory of helping out the channel by dropping a like on the video and letting me know your thoughts down in the comments. Or even that a whole world of side-splitting RPG content is only one subscribe button click away. Heading back and exploring further, we happen upon the location of Bugsy's hybrid monstrosity, and with adding a little sawdust to Blackhawk's cage, we set up a trap for the little bugger. <laughs> And with the world's most disturbing Pokemon captured, traveling back we find a gargoyle who at first glance seems fierce, but of course with Limbo of the Lost isn't quite what it seems. Um, I didn't think you'd want that bit translated. <laughs> After giving the gargoyle the soul of the warrior to pass it, because, yes, we find a metal spear. Okay, but um, is this class to stealing? Oh, okay, so now you're suddenly concerned about stealing. As well as a flying insect birthed out of a disturbing creature on the floor, 
which as with most things in this world, just seems to happen with a randomness that can only be linked to one too many Jaeger bombs whilst browsing a video game asset store. But with the now captured book, comes the chance to trade with old Arak, returning to him for a gift and another cursed cutscene. Ah, my favorite. Briggs, please stop doing that face. Oh god, they're both doing it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you must take in exchange for gift. Oh, for god's sake, Briggs. Arak gifts us with a lock-picking finger, which leads us to a set of doors, one of which being made out of solid wood leading us finally out of the Keep of Souls. And just as Briggs took a breath, this happens. Okay, okay, no need to be so rough. If you'd have asked me nicely, I would have given you those items anyway. After literally being thrown into the next area, a dark set of sewers, biking onto a misty swampland, we quickly discover a huge man who has fallen on hard times. Either that or he was some kind of crash test dummy for the jigsaw killer. Using Arak's finger to release him from his jaw clamp, he offers to give us information around how to get out of the swamp for each restraint we can remove. Taking the clamp, we wander further into the swamp to yet again bump into our undead friend. Gooey, I say, say the boy, gooey. Oh no, not you again. Yes, I'm afraid it is me, sailor boy, and I was wondering if you could help me out of this bog. Oh, I suppose so, if I must. <sighs> Hurry up, Briggsy. Shake a leg. Get a move on. No, 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 no! No! Now look what you've done, you clumsy man. Ah! Oh, oh, I'm sorry about that. Mind you, you did say shake a leg. <laughs> no, that's all right, really. Tonight I was feeling a little legless when I was thrown out of the inner sin and dumped in here. Inner of sin? Yes, it's a little place that some of us four lost souls do like to frequent from time to time. Hmm. I'll keep an eye out for that place. I'm sure as will he. Oops. Ow, bugger. And after we once more pull him out of the treacherous situation that he's got himself in, grants us a rusty dagger, which we are relieved to see is exactly that, as once again was found sticking into his behind. Unlocking a nearby vent as advised by the towering prisoner, we make our way through the sewer system, encountering a sign pointing us in the direction of the office of... Whoa. Which after reaching, we rap on the door to see who is home. Could you help me, please? I need your help. Come over the end. Open the door. Oh, nine, nine, nine. I, I would be too worried. I would not sleep for a week. Oh, go on. Please. Run, tiny German man. Run very, very far away. Despite the deafening warning signs, the tiny man lets Briggs in and explains that we have walked into the office of the Worriers and he holds the title of the Worry Meister. Worriers? Yeah, I am here to worry about what the others are worrying about, you see. It's very simple. So... What are you worrying about? Clearly, not enough. The Worry Meister agrees to let Briggs stay, providing he doesn't get in the way at all, and returns to his book of things to worry over. Oh dear, I am very worried about you. I could worry for a million lifetimes and it would not be enough. Now with access to the office, Briggs quickly thanks the tiny man by instantly getting in the way as much as humanly possible. Wandering through the office, Briggs finds an absolute treasure trove of stolen assets masquerading as an armory, collecting a metal hammer from the ground. The task then falls to gathering items to rid the giant man of his chains and bindings. By stabbing a giant tentacle monster in the eyeball with a fountain pen for its key, locating some metal cutters, and recruiting a gang of rats from what I imagine an AI drawing of Marilyn Manson would look like. Releasing the giant man from his bindings, he kicks away the heavy ball from his chain, and with the aid of some roided up rats, 
We transport it all the way to the sewer docks to plug a grate and provide some water to use the boat to escape the sewers and getting a look at our next destination of Darkmere. Maybe there we will finally get some answers to all this madness. What do the four evils want with Briggs? And what does it all mean? Arriving at what looks like a town, the pint-sized Worrymeister rushes up to us informing us that a friend of ours is in Darkmere and is, surprise surprise, worried about us. Which is quite topical, as just as the small German fellow runs off, he encounters something to be truly worried about all right. The little girl or tiny middle-aged woman, at this point it could be either, disappears into the night after declaiming her suspicion of Briggs being responsible for the little guy's death. A ton of events to be worried about indeed, even if Briggs looks alarmingly happy about it. Oh, and a quick congratulations to Briggs, as that is one of the best expressions so far. Moving up on the town, we are greeted with an eerie message explaining of a curfew in Darkmere. But why, Briggs thought, before continuing on to meet one of the local beggars which for some reason is giving me flashbacks of me covering me before. Okay, I think I might have gone too far this time. Who offers up some much needed exposition around the Soul Takers and Darkmere. Below and above, which the very foundations of this place were laid. Thus, Darkmere. Now that was proper acting. Proper acting indeed. He even ad-libbed a bunch of stuff on top. The malevolent mare that lies below and above, which the very foundations of this place were laid. Thus, Darkmere. The man explains that the malevolent creature must have been summoned here, a spirit born from the four dark generals. The preys upon the souls within the town of Darkmere, controlled by those that summon it, its presence haunting the town and baffling both its mayor and the local authorities. Progressing further, we finally stumble upon the Inn of Sin, and after conversing with the charming owner, we find an intoxicated local who expresses his concern around the mayor's recent behavior. And it's while talking to the man that the Walmart Justice League show up. <laughs> arresting our Briggs and throwing him into the town's prison. Lol. The jailer jeering at our predicament provides us with our last meal. That is nothing more than a bowl of putrid meat and insects, leaving us to ponder just how we could go about making an escape. And it's here that Limbo of the Lost once again showcases just how ridiculous its mechanics can be. Will Briggs be required to attempt his escape using the hammer in his possession? Maybe the severed finger that is known to pick locks? Or maybe even the metal cutters? Nope, the plan lands on flailing our last meal out of the window to summon yet another cursed NPC interaction with an old friend. Ah, wriggles, crunchies and squirmies I smell. Arak, it's you. Arak it is, and once again you're all locked up. This is a bad thing. Yes, I know. Can you help? <laughs> ah, now I go, all filled up. But soon I will send some helpfulness. Thank you, Arak. Ah, no need for thankfuls. It's a gift. An old friend that as it happens remarkably comes through. This is an order for your release, signed by the mayor. It seems that you have friends in high places. Why, thank you, and congratulations on that ridiculous attempt at an American accent. Finally, we are taken to the town authority figure, the mayor. Oh, God, how did I know he was going to look like that? Oh, come in. It seems we have done you a great injustice, my good fellow. Although that's quite impressive. This man actually has a voice that's more ridiculous than his face. The mayor explains that our soul-collecting acquaintance, Onegus, vouched for our release with both him and the mayor agreeing that Briggs will become the detective of Darkmere due to his puzzle-solving abilities, and provides him with a badge and a map to begin tracking down the creature known as the Soul Eater. All of this transpiring right on time, as the jailer bursts in with the news of yet another attack that has just taken place. And after taking a look at the most recent victim, Briggs sets about notepad in hand to visit the town folk and try and uncover what he can about this sinister mystery, getting a chance to showcase his incredible detective skills. Detective? Uh, I say, detective, we found another one. Can you hear me? 
Who's responsible for these terrible things? Well, it'll be that old soul taker, I figure. Ah, well, that's that soul then. I don't know about you, but I don't know why he's not been knighted already. Visiting the Mortal Kombat DLC blacksmith, and is now for some reason armless daughter. She don't need no arms. The town mystic with a seemingly horrendous case of indigestion. Shadows may seek even this place. And a visit to the pie shop where Briggs begins to show his mental fatigue. The fact is, I've never solved so much as one. Be honest, I can't even give him away. You mean you can't even give them away? No, Briggs, I'm sure she meant something else entirely. And then to the town cobbler where Briggs breaks down completely into a dribbly mess. Well, in that case, you could be of help. You trying to, you trying to speak, Briggs? You, you trying to say something? Briggs, you, you, what, are you trying to speak? After a moment to gather himself, Briggs sets off to one of the town's shops for a mind-bending experience. At least this time, not for him. <laughs> oh my god, oh, you've got to be joking me. <laughs> they didn't even try. I don't know who that guy was. This very familiar looking chap is the owner and brother of the bootleg John Wayne jailer of the town, who between them own a number of locations around Darkmere, such as the stables and the abattoir, with Danny here being in charge of looking after the shop. Well, someone's got to keep an eye on this place, ain't they? I mean, you never know who might come in. Well, it's a good thing that he's keeping an eye on it, because, well... Bethesda clearly didn't. With the man grilled for answers, we turn to leave the establishment, only to be quickly stopped in our tracks. Whoa. I tell you what, Fallout 3, Metal Gear Solid 4, and Dead Space appearing in 2008 had absolutely nothing on. Whoa. After a little more investigation, we track down the thrower of the snowball containing the letter, who amazingly manages the challenge of the top spot on the most cursed faces of this game with an absolute world-ending face that actually made my balls detach completely from my body and run out the room entirely by themselves. With a seemingly endless number of locations visited, disturbing inhabitants questioned, some occult symbols discovered, and evidence gathered, Briggs put the word out to the village to gather everyone together for his big reveal inside the town hall. And after a long presentation, laying out some of the evidence, such as a cork left at the scene of one of the crimes, clearly made out of plastic, and that the snow falling from the sky actually being ash, an utterly original concept. And it is revealed that a number of the villagers have conspired together to summon the Soul Eater, who has taken the form of none other than the town's mayor. And with that, Briggs handles the situation then and there, in a hilarious cutscene straight out of an LSD-tinged episode of Scooby-Doo. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you your soul taker. With the case closed, we say our goodbyes. And if by clockwork, I'll whisk off to the next chapter by the Fast Travel Ogre. <laughs> it was arriving and taking a look around the rundown train station of Chapter 4 that I genuinely suspect the developers behind Limbo of the Lost were betting on no one having the patience or the stupidity to actually make it this far in the game. And after a long investigatory chapter, Briggs in this chapter is tasked by a man called the Jailer over the location speaker system to whiz around on a train, picking up a few parts for the repairs he needs to make at the facility and to resolve the lockdown, which in all took Briggs a fraction of the time to complete. And although brief, Chapter 4 could not help itself, however, concluding with by far the most confusing cutscene yet, that of our old friend randomly appearing atop what I can only describe as a gaming chair designed by Elon Musk. Get right up here, I wonder what this lever does. Oh? Okay, then what about this one? Oh no! We're off! Oh, it's okay, Mr. Genesis, sir. I will fix this track for you with the help of my new first friend. Help me! No!
At last we arrive at the Citadel and the final chapter, another swift set of objectives before us, collecting tokens from a statue that looks like a place to get your underworld parking tickets. And as we draw to the game's conclusion, it was clear that old Briggs here was beginning to lose his grip a tad. Or maybe that was me. Oh, where's he gone? Are you sure? Yes, come on Briggs. Only the collection of seven door knockers representing the deadly sins stood between us and victory, as we brace ourselves for the epic conclusion. Uh, it's very dark down here. <gasps> what? <laughs> Well, that escalated quickly. With the timer ticking away, what I imagine to be a spectre version of Briggs is tasked with going and pressing buttons correlating to the seven deadly sins, because apparently door knockers didn't cut it. And through sheer metal and unprecedented point and click skill, escape the clutches of what I assume to be the four evil dudes they mentioned at the start to claim victory. What's going on? I can't see a thing. Oh my god. Words cannot express the confusion I am feeling right now. Thank you for coming with me on this crazy journey. And as we play out this last dose of nightmare fuel, and to conclude a montage of what we'll call happy accidents that the developers stumbled upon while making the game. And what a game it is. Let me know how many you spotted and your thoughts on this one. Drop a like on the video if you enjoyed and subscribe for oh so much more. And if it's more Limbo of the Lost you're after, I highly recommend this video by Mandalore Gaming from back in 2018, going over a bit more of the history of the game. It was after seeing a few clips of this video that convinced me to take a look at this utter insanity myself, not to mention he's a great creator. Hope you enjoy the montage and I'll see you guys in the next one. Uh, if it were me, I would turn to drink. <coughs> uh, well, that's the reason I think he should be the, uh, the uh, king of limbo. Yeah, he had to be taking up sins, but at least he kept his in him. I think that we should be crowning him the king of limbo. Take it away with you, baby. What more can a poor boy do? Working for the likes of me and you. What more can a poor boy say? But I could use your help in any way. We've all had fun, you must agree. Even though interactively. But now we feel that Rick should be the king of limbo. I do what? I do be do well. I do.